I am Daniel Lukies and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read the last 40 years. And today, I have my special guest. He is a award winning author and, of course, best selling author too. No other than Mr. Matt Coyle. Hello, Daniel. Thanks for having me again. Good to be back. Yes, and thank you for your time. And as usual, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm a uh, stated Matt Coyle. I write the Rick Cahill crime novels. Um, there are currently 10. The newest one, um, Odyssey's End, just came out yesterday. This is as we're recording it. Today is the 15th. Um, and Rick is a former cop who's now a private investigator who has kind of a, um, sketchy past perhaps because he was accused of murdering his wife, uh, many years ago when he was a cop. Now he takes cases where he tends to get emotionally involved and that leads to sometimes bad outcomes. Yes, people, if you miss our episode, please do listen to our previous episode because we talk about the Odysseys and the book 10 of the Ray Cahill series. So, Mr. Matt, which one of your books we're going to talk about today? Well, I think, Daniel, we're talking about Last Redemption. Is that correct? Yes. Number eight. The book eight series. So, Mr. Matt, Redemption, how did you draft it? Well, there's Rick Scott, uh, a sometimes partner who's also a private investigator named Maura McFarland, and she is a little more well put together than he is. She's kind of got her stuff together. She doesn't tend to make rash decisions like Rick does, so she's kind of a steadying influence for him. Um, and he's really their their best friends, although it's kind of more of like a um, older sister, younger brother situation where there's some antagonism, but there's there's familial love as well. Uh, so Rick is used to kind of being the one who just jumps in with both feet, and she's the one pulling it back. But in this situation, in the beginning, he gets a call from her, and she's quite uh, harried. She's quite upset uh, regarding her son. She thinks her son is, well, there's been a restraining order put against her son, and she thinks that he, from his girlfriend, and she thinks he is still kind of stalking her, so she asks Rick to follow him to make sure he's not and to try to keep him out of trouble. And Rick does find that he is following his ex-girlfriend and he's not supposed to because there's a restraining order. Um, and that leads to a lot of machinations. So Last Redemption is the most popular on all of the series, what do you think make this popular? Uh, well, I think it's as popular as the others. Um, I think they're all mostly the same. Um, I think the, the kind of the switching Rick, where Rick has to be the steadying influence is different from all the others. And it also shows the real bond that he and Moira have together. And um, there's also the ending is something no one, I think, could have expected happened. So um, I'll leave that at that, of course, because we don't want to have any spoilers. But it's Rick showing a, a, a little bit of a different side. It's showing really a different side of Moira. Moira's become quite a popular character. Most of the readers I talk to, aside from Rick, and even sometimes over Rick, Moira is a favorite character. So I think seeing her um, not so steady, being upset, and having to go through something with her family uh, people really um, are attracted to that and they're rooting for her. To all of the series, Mr. Matt, which one is your favorite? Well, I would say uh, there's, well, of course, the new one I like quite a bit. I'm very proud of it. I would say maybe Blood Truth, which is the fourth book in the series. And it's kind of a father son story in some ways where Rick looks back because his father has died and his father was thought to be a bent cop and in it, Rick 
discovers the truth. Um, but it's sort of a father-son story. And I had intended to write it anyway, but my father died a few months before I started writing it. So it's very, uh, there's that connection for me. It's kind of a, a emotional for me. And it's actually actually emotional for Rick. So I, I think that, I think you see a really very, a lot of different uh, f um, aspects of Rick's, of who he is in that book. But I got to say Blind Vigil, which was book eight, seven, six, six, seven, eight, book seven. Um, that was the most challenging to write. Uh, if you can kind of guess by the title, Rick loses his eyesight and having to write a first person private investigator who has to figure something out while he's lost his vision is was very challenging and really stumped me for a while, but was really rewarding when I finally put it together. And it did win. Um, it did win the Seamus for best PI novel. Wow. Congratulations, Mr. Matt. For all those centuries, are you not getting tired of Mr. Rick? Not at all. No, Rick. I, I learn more about him every book. Um, it becomes, I've been writing him. It took me 10 years to get published. And this is my 10th book. Uh, one we talked about last week, Odyssey's End, um, or Link Before. And uh, so I've been in, I've been writing in first person in one character's head for over 20 years. So he's really like a family member to me. I, I know him. Uh, I see the, when I'm writing him, I see the world through his eyes looking out. So I've been in his head. He's been in mine for over 20 years. So, and, and I know his heart because it's part of mine. So it's, uh, I know he's very special to me and I don't, I'm not tired of him at all. So Mr. Matt, Rick is a part of your life. Yeah. Is it something, is. is it Mr. Rick is associated within your life? Well, when I'm writing a when I'm writing a book, yeah, it's kind of in the background. When I'm, you know, when I'm going through my everyday life, it's a little bit in the background. But if I'm driving somewhere specifically, then I'm always working on story. And if I'm taking a long drive, I'm really lost in story. So yes, it's something that I that I'm always thinking of. But you know, I'm still able to kind of go through the normal routines of life. But yeah, I'm always kind of working on story, especially when I'm under contract and under time constraints describe the research process behind last redemption last redemption what kind of research do i have to do for last redemption um it's gonna take me a minute to zero back on that let's see there was oh that was a lot to do with the pharmaceutical business uh comp actually no that was new legacy sorry um <laughs> i don't know about, well there was something i had to at the end of last redemption which i won't um I don't want to spoil it for people, but there was disease I had to look, I had to learn about, which I learned quite a bit about. Um, so I spent time uh, talking to some doctors, figuring out what um, kind of ailment, because Rick is, in the beginning of the book, he's all of a sudden going through this situation where he um, kind of gets, kind of fogs out a little bit, and he'll be driving, and he, and he pull over, he doesn't, for a second, he doesn't know where he's going, or where he is, but then it comes back. So I had to figure out what, what that was all about. Um, and there happens to be a mystery writer doctor named Doug Lyle, who's very helpful to all mystery writers in situations like that. So I got some information from him and I did some other research too. So I was kind of in that mode for that. Um, there was also, I'm sorry, the book's about two, three years old when I wrote it. So, but there was something I actually had to research quite a bit. <laughs> I just can't remember what else. <laughs> There was something that the, the, the son, before he went missing, Moira's son, he worked for a um, technology company and he was doing some work for, um, no, it is, it is pharmaceuticals. I apologize. It is pharmaceuticals. So I did, I had to um, research pharmaceutical companies because he was doing some work for a pharmaceutical company and something seemingly uh, nefarious was going on. So yes, I did quite a bit of research on uh, pharmaceuticals, big pharma for that book. And that was fun. Um, so that was tied in as well. And I won't talk too much about it because I don't want to give anything away. But I'm, yes. I'm, glad that I, I'm glad that I can remember. I had it the first time. I didn't trust it. But yes, pharmaceuticals. <laughs> for the last redemption, what are the challenges did you face while you were writing this book? 
Well, I was I uh, the the ending that I won't talk about. I, the challenge was I I put a really different dynamic into Rick's life that was going to affect. And this is the end of the book. That was going to affect the rest of the series, and I had to really decide if that's the way I wanted to go because it really changed the trajectory of the series. But I did. It made for a very good ending. It made for challenges going forward, but that's okay. I think when you're challenged as a writer, you generally um, are able to produce your best work. You know, people talk about writer's block and all that, and some writers don't believe in writer's block, but sometimes when you write yourself into a corner and really challenge yourself, you really have to dig down and figure out what it is you're writing about down underneath the surface. And uh, that forced me to do that, not only in this book, but all books going forward. For all those 10 series, how did you connect with each other? Yeah, I really didn't. Um, I, when I was writing uh, yesterday's Echo, the first book, like I said, started writing it 20 years ago. I was just wanting to write a book and get a book published because there's something that I studied for in college, but didn't really follow through on. I didn't write for many years, and, or I would just occasionally write on some weekend when I thought I was um, inspired. And when you're a professional writer, you learn that inspiration is good for a few pages, but the rest is work. So I wasn't ready to put the work in for many years. And when I finally got yesterday, when I, as I started to write yesterday's Echo, started to learn more about this character I came up with, Rick Cahill, I realized, wow, there is, there's more to this guy than I knew. So it can be a series. Because with each book I write, the more I learn about his history. That's the kind of way it works for me. I didn't do a huge character arc beforehand. I didn't, um, you know, figure out every little nuance of his earlier life. I learn that as it goes. He grows, his backstory grows. So um, it's been a fun learning, get to know him process for many years. So the connections come on, the connections come from how does whatever situation that he's in in each book affect him and how will that carry over to the next book. And that kind of helps set up the next book, even though there's there are different cases he works because he's a private investigator, but there's always a connection of what is he going through in his uh, private life, his personal life, that taking this next case will make more difficult. And there's always the, the leftover emotion or heartache or whatever from the previous case. So, Really, the connection is what connects all the stories is um, Rick striving to be um, a more f full human being and often failing. Wow. Interesting indeed, Mr. Matt. But before we go on, I want to shout out to the people listening in Norway. Thank you so much, Norway, for supporting this podcast because it's hot. Because in Oslo County, I got 39% housing sale. Rogaland at 27, Viken at 9, Baskerud at 9%, Morg of Gravsdal at 5%, Westfold at 2%, and many more. Thank you, Norway, for supporting this podcast. Because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world like Mr. Matt Coyle. Sir Matt, can you share to us the secret of having a award-winning piece? Yeah, I don't think that you one can aim towards, I honestly don't think one can aim towards awards or even um, wealth when writing. I think you have to, maybe some can, maybe some can, can chase the market and find what people are really interested in and be able to ride that wave. But I think the best writing is done by some, about something you're really interested in. And so I just write about this character that I've come to know who's da who's damaged. And I try to make him, I try to make the books exciting as possible, but while living in the world that, that he's created around himself and try to make everything make sense. He makes bad decisions, but because that's because who he is, he doesn't always make bad decisions. He's pretty smart too, <laughs> but he, he makes decisions that, that the reader has come to understand. This is, this is who this person is. And he risks his life at times, but he doesn't just risk it to be a hero. He risks it for, 
for reasons that are um, kind of ingrained in him for things that have happened in his past. And so I, I just try to make him as real as possible in a very unreal situation, unreal world. And so, you know, whatever happens after that, great. You know, there's a lot of revision that goes in the books. I'm constantly um, fine tuning for many months. So I try to make them, you know, as, as smooth a read as possible and conveying what I want to convey. But I'm um, sure it's, uh, it's nice to get nominated for awards and I'm, I'm always happy and honored when I do, but really I'm just trying to write the best book I possibly can and learn something new about Rick Cahill with each book. Yes, congratulations. So what's one thing or message you have readers who take away from the series, the Rick Cahill series? Uh, good question. Um, I think, well, first of all, here's what I, here's the main thing is that I want them to be entertained and because that's, that's why we do this. Uh, we might be trying to tell our interpretation of the world around us, the real world and all that. But I think the writers, fiction writers, first responsibility is to entertain. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And then, yes, I've created a character that I'm, I'm lucky enough to have readers that care about him and all the characters, Moira as well, all the characters. So I want to continue their lives in fiction. Um, and I'm hope, I just hope, I'm in, I hope that they learn something a little new about Rick and maybe understand, you know, I mean, I think, well, I think all writers are really trying to work things out about themselves as they write, um, subconsciously probably. And, Rick is quite damaged, so maybe I'm trying to work through some of my own shortcomings in life. And hopefully with each book, I'm making a little progress. But uh, And maybe readers see that in themselves as well. I'm not sure. I'm getting a little deep here, really. I'm getting pat beyond my idea of just, just entertain them. So really hope they're entertained and care about Rick a little more with each book. Very well said, Mr. Matt. So are you planning to go outside from your comfort zone and make a series like that? I'm writing something right now outside my comfort zone, something completely different. Um, writing in third person, which I haven't done for decades and decades. Uh, so yes, I am, I am outside of my comfort zone, very uncomfortable right now writing something. It's of course it's in crime. I won't write anything but crime. I love the crime. And by crime, I mean the overall mystery, um, you know, the huge genre, subgenres that mystery had. But that's what I read. That's what I write. That's what I love. Uh, um, so it's crime, but it's different. And as of right now, it's in third person with multiple points of view, which I've never done. Looking forward to that, Mr. Matt. So what advice would you give to aspiring authors? Who are looking to embark on their own writing journey? Well, I would say first of all, um, learn the basics. You don't have to adhere to them as you write, although some people adhere um, really strictly to them and are very successful. But uh, you know, take some for you know. I took a, adult uh, creative writing classes, uh, novel writing classes, from someone, Carolyn Wheat. Uh, many years ago, 20 plus years ago. So learn the basics and then write what you want to write about and, but stretch yourself. But, you know, you've been reading, writers have been reading all their lives, I hope. So I, I would imagine they're attracted to some genre of whatever writing or sub sub genre of whatever um, writing. So clearly if that's where their interests are, that's what they should be writing about because that's what will get your uh, motor running. So, um, you know, I'm not saying to copy writers that you like, but um, learn the craft. And after you, once you start writing, you start reading differently. You start saying, well, why did they do that? I, I, that's interesting how she wrote that. Um, so you're always learning, but here's the main thing, Daniel, is you have to write. For many years, I would tell people I was a writer or wanted to be a writer and I wasn't writing. So, you got to put your butt in the seat and write. You got to write when it's hard, which is most of the time. You got to write when it's easy. You got to write when um, you're busy. You got to find time. 
um, you have to write. And writing every day is, is I mean, Woody, Woody Allen famously writes every day. I think most writers write every day. Yes. Um, there are times after you finish the book where you're, you know, taking a little time off. But when you're working on something, you basically write every day. You're not writing eight hours every day, but you're writing every day. Yes. Practice makes you perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How has your perspective as an author evolved since the publication of the Rick Cahill series? Well, I think once you get immersed in the business aspect of writing, you're, it's kind of eye-opening. You realize it's very difficult to make a living doing it. It's um, There's so much you have to do in terms of your own marketing. You really have to look at it as a bit, if you're serious about it, if you just want to write and get a book published and you know say you did that, that's fine. But if you're serious about it, you have to treat it as a business. You are the business and you have to, and this is something I'm you know, I'm always trying to get better at. You have to be efficient. I'm not a very efficient writer with my time, but I try to be more efficient with my time down from writing. You have to, you're, you're, you're marketing like right now with the book out just out now, I'm marketing all the time. I'm spending much more time marketing than I'm writing. So you got to learn how to market the books, which is really hard. It's kind of hard to figure out what works and what doesn't. There's a lot of hit and miss. Um, be part of the community you're writing in. You definitely have to, uh, and that includes being on social media, and, and but being, not just spouting about your work all the time, really being a member of the community and, and, and um, you know, learning about other people, not just about yourself, because uh, nobody wants to just hear someone talk about themselves all the time. So there's all that that's involved. There, there's a lot more than just the writing involved, and that's challenging. Some of it you learn to like. Like, I really enjoy doing book events. I enjoy doing podcasts, like talking to you, Daniel. But there's other aspects I don't really like doing, but um, you have to do anyway. Yes, you need to do it. <laughs> Once you publish your book, people, you are already entrepreneurs. So think like an yeah. entrepreneur, people. Sell, sell, sell your books. So how do you see your book feeding into the broader literary landscape? or cultural conventions? Wow, now you're asking me to think. Um, <laughs> not, it's, not, it's not my strong point. Uh, I, I think that, you know, there's a niche for everybody. And I think that, you know, I, I started writing, and Rick, if you sit back, Rick Cahill is really hard-boiled fiction. When you're talking about going back to Raymond Chandler Ross McDonald, Dashiell Hammett, which is all, they're all great names and everything, but it's not the most popular genre or subgenre of mystery right now, hard-boiled fiction. And hard-boiled doesn't mean it's all, um, you know, chest-pounding, boister stuff. It's not that at all. It's very internal. Um, but there's a certain um, classification that kind of fits in when you're writing about a private detective in first person. It's basically considered hard-boiled. So it's not the most popular genre. But... Um, it's funny when you sometimes someone will come across your book, maybe a friend gave it to them, or maybe you even like, for example, people you went to high school with, because I did an event in my hometown last night where there's a lot of people that thankfully follow me because they knew me in high school, but maybe I, maybe I don't write their genre, but when they start reading, they realize that they like it. They like learning about a new character. They like learning about, um, different situations. Maybe they don't, they don't usually read mysteries, but hey, this is kind of cool trying to figure this out. And, and so, um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm a little piece in this huge um, culture of of entertainment, tiny tiny little piece. But it's kind of amazing when you. In fact, <laughs> I'm, last night doing an event, um, a friend of a guy came up with one of my friends one of my friends i've known since we were in kindergarten a lot over 50 years ago that's how old i am and i got he came with another guy a friend of his who i knew in high school but didn't really know didn't what weren't friends or anything and so he told me that he'd read all my books and how much he liked them i mean he was <laughs> really it was it really made me feel good he was really effusive in his praise and you think i you know you would never have any idea someone and uh he's a successful businessman and that you can reach people that way and to get that feedback is really cool. So 
people are reading your books out there that you'll i was fortunate to to meet, see him again but there are people reading your books out there you'll never meet and people you you know i have a lot i have a really good relationship with my fans on social media but there's people that read me that don't that don't are on social media don't contact me on my website that um I'm, I'm hoping this is true that are probably big fans. So it's, it's kind of um, very inspiring to know that what you all this, all this work you're putting in, in the dark when nobody's watching all the, uh, the revisions and the, the insecurity about what you're writing and then finding out how it can really touch people. is pretty cool. It makes it worthwhile. Definitely. Indeed. It's something else. It make your heart bigger than you. So, Mr. Matt, do you think the Ray Cahill series will be your legacy? That's a good question. Uh, well, I, in, in one respect, yes. I don't have any children, and I'm way too old now to have any. Um, so if however Rick may go on, if I don't write another series that's um, as long or as good, I would say yes. That after I'm gone, there might be people still reading Rick Cahill on some reading device that they can probably read in their head in 50 years from now. They don't have to buy. You know, Amazon will plant it in their head and they can read whatever they want. <laughs> well done, Mr. Matt. But before we go on, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Love Letters, people. Love Letters are a collection of love stories of people get lost, get crazy, and disoriented in the name of love. We will learn from these stories and left in their shoes to feel what it's like to be in love. Plus, my books are out. My 100 episodes of the first season, people. Love Letters, Volume 1, History. Love Letters, Volume 2, Stories. So please do grab a copy available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So, Mr. Matt, can you invite our listeners to support all your books? Yeah. Please, please do. Um, yeah, my website's mattcoilbooks.com, not surprisingly. You can follow me on um, Facebook, where I'm most active on social media, Matt Coyle, I think. Um, and a little bit on Instagram, mcoyle044, and Twitter, at coilem, I think. But yeah, um, you know, my, my books are available everywhere, and if you like audio, I know a lot of people like audio books. My All my books are on audio. they they have a lot of them have different narrators. There's probably in 10 books, there's probably at least five narrators. So they can decide which ones they like best. But yes, my books are available everywhere. I'm out there. I would love to hear from new readers. Yes, people, I support Mr. Matt Coyle because if you support him, more 20 series to come. So, Mr. Matt, what inspired you to become an author? I've always read. I've always read. I remember I, my family's, you know, we're, we're, we're about reading. My, I've always read uh, mysteries my whole life, going back to Agatha Christie and Conan Doyle. Um, incidentally, it's in the it's in my DNA. My great aunt wrote a play called uh, Harvey, which was about a man who thought he had his best friend was a six foot invisible rabbit. The play was made into a movie with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, famous actor from years gone by and it was a huge success before I was born huge success and um, she actually won the Pulitzer Pulitzer Prize for writing a play about a guy who thought his best friend was a six foot invisible rabbit if you can believe that <laughs> so it's in my blood my my that was on my father's side on my mother's side her grandmother wrote too never published but she wrote she came across the uh, West in a covered wagon. That's how old she was. You know, that's how far back we go. And she wrote poems about that experience. She wrote poems her whole life. And um, one of her sons or grandsons, I think, put together just a little book that, you know, we could all read. So published or not, the creative, uh, the love of writing is from both sides of my family. So, and my brother was a great writer. He he wrote um, blogs and things regarding politics, but he was a really good writer too. So it's in the blood and uh, something I always wanted to do since I was probably 14, 
maybe younger, but as I stated earlier, it took me too long to do it. But yeah, always loved reading crime, always wanted to write it, and um, can't imagine doing anything else now. <laughs> so can you tell us about your writing process? Too me it's too messy. Yes. Um, I would never recommend it. So I don't outline. I have, an, I have a vague idea. I have an idea of the ending of the book. And so that's my target. And I have my major thing is I decide what subplot, what, what em emotional turmoil is my main character, Rick Cahill, going through that taking, because he's a private investigator, that taking a case will make more difficult. So it also always starts with Rick. The, the story, of course, the through line, the plot, that's very important. But how I get there from step to step is how Rick reacts to things. I know who the bad guys are when I start. I know what they want. I know what they did. But um, the ending can change. The ending can, I mean, it's a target, but it can change. But even if you don't outline like me, I think it is important to have something that you're aiming for. Because instead of just wandering in the darkness, you know there's an ending out there that as you wander, you're trying to make your way there. If you're just wandering for wandering's sake, um, it's even more inefficient than what I do. So I was joking when I said I can't talk about my process, but it's a very, it's a very messy process. My first drafts are always over, um, we're usually over a hundred thousand words, and then I will cut maybe thirty thousand on the first revision, and then of course I'm adding as I'm cutting too. So it's just the way that it works for me. So my first uh, draft is really kind of a huge outline if you think about it. And I revise probably six or seven times with each book, um, polishing as I go, adding, subtracting, learning more about what I'm really trying to say. So as I, as I'm, it's very inefficient. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. I couldn't teach it to anybody, but I've tried to change it and be more efficient. And it's just not the way my brain works, not how the creative process works. So after, you know, 10 books, I've learned just to trust this really messy um, process. So, Mr. Matt, as a gardener, what challenges have you faced in your writing career? Uh, getting published, like I said, it took me, it, well, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't, you're not trying to get published when you're, as you're writing the book. So it probably took me to write a book that I felt was worthwhile of sending out to agents. Probably took four years and I wasn't ready, but I thought it was. So I would say it took six years of sending to agents, getting rejected, revising, sending again, rejections, revising over and over. It probably took me six to seven years to get the yes from my agent. And then she got a um, book deal. And I think about four months after that. But of course, that's the most difficult part is initially getting published. But, um, you know, when you're writing a series, trying to keep things fresh, not not wanting to tell the same story over and over again as you've developed a character that has certain traits it's hard not to do things somewhat similar and just in terms of how it reacts to life but you try to freshen it up as much as possible i'd say that's the most difficult thing well said mr mad and thank you Fitch, for being the number two of the 100 best book podcasts on the planet and number one in the art book category. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Matt, thank you for your time. Thank you, Daniel. It's always an honor. Morikan people, see you soon.